like the slides just like drive my state of like what I've got to talk about. What I do want you to know is that if you register, we'll send you we'll send you a link to the to the slideshow and to the handouts. The handouts themselves, like I keep updating them. I just like updated them last week. And they have like links in in them. So so it's one of those things where I used to print them out, but it's like it's better to have the digital version because you can just scroll through and be like, click here, and it brings you to a website to, to either learn more about that topic or maybe it's a product. And I'm not saying that you have to buy the product from there, but at least it shows you like, hey, you know, this this tray. This tray is the standard size tray. And this is the place where you can get, sorry, I got the camera here, so I'm gonna be like three props back to this question. So this is like a 10, 20 tray. And it's like, why is this? It's 10 inches by 20 inches. And this is the, the greenhouse standard. Why would I recommend this? It's because, because it's the greenhouse standard, it's like what's cheap. And it's what you can get 10 packs, 50 packs of these, and they're mass produced. I'm also gonna talk about, um, not using plastic and and growing things without plastic. But yeah, a little bit of the setup here, you can feel free to come up later and take pictures or whatever. But the things I want you to know is that we we'll want you to leave class with resources that keep your learning level. And I feel like you don't have to like write everything down anymore. You can just revisit this stuff. And the same thing with like the pictures. I don't think like the pictures in my slideshow are anything crazy special. Some of them trigger a memory from the talk. You can go back and you look at it and learn it. Good, just nothing. Okay, I teach a bunch of other classes, so feel free. Feel free to go to my website. Oh, look, you can stalk me. That's my public calendar of all the libraries that I go to. So, so yeah, I was looking through it. I'm like, oh my God, a lot of places. But anyway, so I'm in Windsor Box tomorrow in the container garden. I did container garden here last yeah, year. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Anyway. So, uh, so that's my website, it's in my car. Uh, it's it's tridagoline.com. Oh boy, it's enough. We named the farm and it's like, the house has three gables, there's the tridagable. And, and a lee is a clearing that one would like, it's an old, old, old English word. It's like the third oldest English word. And it means to clear your land for where you're gonna make your homestead. That's literally what we did. If there was wood, Right up where our house is, I cleared it all out. Well, okay, let's learn about seed starting. Let's start with this. How have you killed your seedlings? Um, please, Good. can we have some Go for it. Okay, yes. We said maybe it might, it might have been an overheating thing. Maybe, maybe exposure to the elements. Well, else? Well, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Watering is like one of the ways that they all die. Too much water, too little water. Absolutely. Who else? Yeah. Absolutely. And you kind of have to do, not for nothing, you kind of have to go through a cycle of like learning what is too much. You have my permission to kill some plants by overwatering them, and then you know what's too much. You're like, oh, well, I should never do that again. You have my permission to, like, you're going to do it. Do not water some and find out that they just like dry out. You're like, oh, no, this is like, you're going to go through this part of it. Anybody else? All right, what is it, So, is anybody like growing like plants on their windowsill and they got like little tall and straight and everything? And then maybe they even snap. Like, I've done that. I've done that. So, so, Part of part of part of today is to talk about like variables. So I'm a math teacher, but a science science person like that part. Like I've got books up here that I've learned from. Oh my God. Love this. Forget it. You were talking about timing, timing of the whole year. So there we go for the camera or whatever. But um, this one this one's called the vegetable, the week by week vegetable gardeners, and it's linked in the handout. Don't worry, you don't have to like feel like you gotta write things down. Um, but it goes through week by week what you can and what you should do. What when's our last frost up here? Is it like is it the end of April, beginning of May? Yeah, I know we're closer to the shore here, right? So are we almost at last frost time? So we got like two weeks or so. That, does that sound about right? 
two weeks and then we're kind of in the clear. So <laughs> it just falls in front. So, so what am I doing? I'm going in here, I'm going in this club. And it's week by week. So I go to the section that's like two weeks before cross. If I went to the section that was eight weeks before cross, it'd be like, hey, these are, you know, you could plant these outside right now. So this is stuff that you can leave this class and like you could start these things. So you could still keep planting cold hardy plants like like your peas, cauliflower, onions, lettuce, spinach, chard, kale, and, and your root crops. So beets and beets and carrots are all that jazz. And it zoning them right in the garden. Sowing them right in the garden, not as like little transplants. Um, and then cabbage and broccoli and stuff like that. You could start, it says, start sowing a second sowing of them indoors as transplants. So that means this book has pages before where it's like, hey, you can start broccoli now. So you have multiple harvests of some, something like that. This, you know, like this, like a box. So much. I love this. Um, it's meant to be a journal where you write in it. Like I did. And so, so this has like, this has a few years of mine, and it completely transformed the way that I that I garden because it helped me with the timing of stuff. Um, I'm also going to keep referring to to this book. It's the the square foot gardener. The, the one was it? Yeah, square foot gardening. It's anybody? It's a classic book. It's been around forever. This is the third edition. Square foot gardening is about initially started out with how to space plants. Within a garden, if you divide it up into a grid, so you got that four foot by eight foot garden bed. Well, four feet by eight feet, you got a grid, four times eight. So maybe you don't know that. Four, four times eight. I'm a math teacher. Just pointing me. Come on. 32. So you got 32 square feet of area in that garden to plant. The new edition of this also has the timing stuff worked out. Just like how I said, you calibrate it to, you calibrate these books to whatever your last frost is, and it tells you, okay, this many weeks ahead, this many weeks after, you can do it. In the presentation, there's other stuff like this. This is a chart of about how many years seeds are good for in the seed pack under ideal conditions. So that means that, like, I, I know I'm going to do this. Use some seeds, take the little seed pack, and put it in a drawer, and I save it for next year. And then I try those seeds again next year, and then eventually, it's like, well, nothing's coming up. It's because the seeds are too darn old. You need to be buying seeds, or you need to learn how to store them properly. So, it, like, just going down the vegetable one, you look at some of them that have a one or two year shelf. Corn. Corn's not worth saving. You either use it all this year or throw it. In. So, so and, you know, and the same thing with leeks and onions, that family of things, is it, it, it they? tend to be plants that want to regenerate year after year after year after year. And so within the natural cycle, they have a, a smaller lifespan. Things like lettuce, though, I don't know if lettuce is in the mix. Yeah, lettuce down at five, six years. It's an excellent one to keep the seeds. Now, you guys have your seed bank mm -hmm. and, and are encouraged to even save seeds. I do have a couple books. Oh, my God, if you, if you want to geek out with this, um, I love this book. Just, yeah, the complete product of seed seeds. Um, you're like, I want to learn how to save lettuce. Well, this one, you just look at it and you become an expert on lettuce, you know, one week and then another week, you become an expert on another bunch. And then you learn how to like save the seeds for you. Um, who was talking about just like using a paper towel to start their seeds? It was you again. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry, I come around and you're these people. You get a chance to test these whenever you want. The simple, the simple, like, Damp paper towel, wring the water out, put your seeds in, and then put it in like a little Ziploc bag, and then put it like on top of your refrigerator. Why on top of there? Because it's warmer. It's warmer up top there. Does it have to be up there? No. But what it does is it creates a little microclimate to test your seeds. You think your seeds are old. What you can do is put 10 of them out and see if you can get eight out of 10 of them to germinate, to pop it, open up. And then that tells you if you're wasting your time. If you, if you only get like two or none of them popping up in a week or so to germinate them, then it, you know, like a little seed opens up and it germinates. Then it's, you know that you're not working with good seed. So if you're buying seed, it's definitely, it should be good right off the shelf. Yeah. 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 
So that's a, that's a good question about like how long are seeds in a seed packet or typically they're stamped with a date for the year that they're good for. And then the seed companies don't take any ownership over any years after that year. So all of the seeds that are packaged for 2024 that are on the shelf now, they're good for this year. And then after that, they can't guarantee it because the store, those seeds sitting on the store shelf are aging. And that, that's actually part of, part of the talk. We'll talk about seeds and like the aging and everything. We'll even pass some, some seeds around for you guys to get a good close look at look at them. So so yeah, this class is geeking out about seeds and stuff. Um so there's stuff like this that you can refer to. Things that have like deep, deep, deep roots, like carrots and stuff like that, they need not be things that you necessarily want to grow indoors for a very long time. You may want to go directly to the garden with them because they have a deep taproot that grows. Um, or it means that maybe, maybe there are things that you need to be careful about them running out of root space. You need to pop them up. So we'll talk about talk about that stuff. Again, things like this, can, like a table like this that helps you see these are the types of plants that you could start from a seed outside in the garden. While the other one, you know, the ones in the plant from transplants means that if you're starting seeds, you're going to start them indoors in a protected environment, your tomatoes, your peppers, and stuff like that, and then bring them outside, your broccoli, your cauliflower, your cabbage. All of those are, are plants that putting them outside, those itty bitty seedlings, well, it's not that they're not going to succeed. We're in Connecticut. So, you know, we're by the shore, we have wind, we get some cold snaps and stuff. The weather that we have is not consistent. The indoor environment that we can try to create is, can be consistent. And that's, that's what we'll look at. And then tables like this. This is from the Square Foot Gardening you know, book, the, the latest edition, the third edition. They added timing stuff like this. So, so right, right here, that zero, that's, so we're at two, two weeks before frost, the last times. And zero, right here, look at this. So you go, so one week after frost, they're saying you could start to think about planting cucumbers house. The soil, the soil should generally be warm enough that you could plant them by seed or by, by transplant. So if you had been growing them as transplants inside, you get one thing like guides like this. This this class isn't about teaching everything. It's about accelerating and giving you resources that you can go to and you can become an expert in your things that you love. So for me, like there, there was a year where like I really wanted to like learn how to grow eggplant. And like, you know, eggplants on this list and notice that like, it is not saying start that by seed outdoors. Eggplant sucks. It's like the bane of my existence. <laughs> so, so the professional, the pros, the garden centers, I used to work at a garden center for years. I used to work on an organic farm for a couple of years as well. We the pros in their special germination um, chambers, they are lucky if they get 50% of the seeds to pop up. So you as the home gardener, if you get 50, 60% of the seeds to pop up, you are on fire. So that also means that like you have a lot of seeds that didn't germinate. It's just the nature, something like that. So the thing that I want you to know is that like like take books like this. I know, real paper books. We're in a library, right? So, so you're still looking at books. Get them through interlibrary loan. Hop on Amazon and buy your own. Or you, you know what I mean? Like I got these through my local interlibrary loan first. And I was like, oh my God, I have to get this. And I bought my own copy. Then I bought it digitally because I'm dyslexic. And so I have that. The Kindle read it to me. And then I have this for everything else. Um, become an expert in the stuff that you want. That's that's like for what I do. One week, one week, I'd be a, I'd have these books on my nightstand, and I'd pick it up, and I'd become an expert on like one point. And the next week, another one. Next week, another one. You do that, and like you now know like how to how to grow anything. I'm just gonna keep moving on. Okay, so what does this mean? Um, this is this is the part of class where like, with middle schoolers from all the time that we have like little backpacks on, and we'll do this. We'll do this. So I am gonna pass around like little seeds. I'm just gonna start on this side. And like, let's have them like zigzag. Just don't just like one at a time. 
Now, space it out. What I want you to see as the seeds come around is that some of them are like dust. Some of them are like the wind just to carry them away. And then some are big honking seeds that have a, have a lot into them. And so, and then others have weird little textures to them. There's actually, uh, it's either beet seeds or something like that, where one seed, if you actually look at it, is a crown, but then there's another crown, another crown, there's like three seeds glued together. And by, again, becoming a little expert in each of these types of seeds, and the sizes and everything, we're going to talk in generalities. A small seed has a small amount of resources. The same, the same like outcome is what we're looking for. These are not artist grade pictures. These are my own stupid little illustrations. I do paint, but this was just like fast. Enough. The thing that I want you to think through is, I think a lot of people. There's three main things that I think people come to these classes wanting to grow: herbs, flowers, veggies. I focus on veggies because if you can do veggies, you can do flowers, you can do herbs. I say them in that order because what does it take for an herb to be successful? Well, the seed has to sprout, and then it has to grow leaves, gather sunlight, because light is food, and then convert that into more growth, and then it has to produce more leaves, and then we come along with chop the leaves, weed the leaves. That's an herb, right? Okay? That's that's your basil, that's that's chives, that's everything. What does it take for a flower to be successful? It has to go through all that. Then it has to mature, get to a stage of maturity where it flowers. Yeah, so it has to like it has to have a longer lifetime, lifespan. What does it take for vegetables to like mature? If we think about a tomato, tomatoes gotta to go through all that stages, then it's got flower. Those flowers have to get pollinated or they're self-pollinated, then a little fruit has to develop, and then and then the plant has to keep photosynthesizing, getting bigger, 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 to pack in and photosynthesize to generate that little cherry tomato. And that cherry tomato is different than a beefsteak tomato. I'm going to go back and forth between these because it's very common just to think about it. If you want success with vegetables, start off with things that are that have fruits that are the smallest because they will require the plant to live the shortest. And do you, do you get where I'm going with that? Where a beef stick, so if we, if we look at the cherry tomato, it's going to take like 60 days. So 60 days from transplant outside. So that doesn't even count, that doesn't even count the amount of time it takes uh, that transplant to grow indoors. So transplant goes to the ground, 60 more days. So that's a couple months before it fruits as cherry tomatoes. Beef steak tomato, it's like 100 days. 80, 90, 100 days before you get beef steak tomatoes. It's because the fruit's bigger. Then you go out to like somebody wants to grow a watermelon. I love it. I love gardening with kids because they want to grow watermelons. They want to grow giant pumpkins and stuff. To grow a pumpkin, the pumpkins that we all have, you know, they are all started early, early, early in the year. You need a huge growing season of 120, 130, 140 days before because those plants make that one big pumpkin that we like, that jack o' lantern that we like. They have to spread their vines out 20 feet in that direction. 20 feet in that direction, 20 feet in this direction. That radius, that 20 foot radius on your lawn is not likely to survive because people are going to come around and want to mow the lawn and weed wet. <laughs> and so we try to grow them. Grow, or sorry. Again, a simple little drawing packed with an HC is life, is a complete set of life ready to start. So, so there's like that endosperm is that food, that's the backpack. So if you imagine this, me having a backpack on, but it's like 10 times bigger than I am. Okay, so me, I'm like 200 pounds. So it's like a thousand pound backpack. You guys okay with this? All right, and I'm the baby C. And like all winter long, I'm munching slowly on that food. You keep me in my little seed pack. And, and I haven't gotten, I haven't, felt the rain and the temperature still kind of cool because maybe you're storing me in the, the freezer. So, so if you take me out of the freezer, so when you put me in the freezer, I, I like stop eating. Stop eating and consuming that that, that stuff that's in back. But okay, I'm, I'm a seed pack, I'm in the seed pack and hang out with one layer of seed for a room temperature. 
meat, no meat. It gets warmer in here. I start to eat and consume the food faster. And, and so, so then you poke in the dirt and, and you get a little wet and then like you, you water me and everything. And then what happens is I expand and I start to eat really fast of that. And then that triggers the growth of the seed and the germination. The reason I talk about this is because let's say you have that seed in the seed pack and you want to save it for the next year. You've been eating away. You keep it at room temperature. It's been eating away at that pack of food for a whole year. But if you want to save the seed from one season to the next, the best practice is to like is to put it in a Ziploc bag, put the air press down, put it in the freezer, and leave it there until you're going to plant. Not like leave it there and then take it out midwinter and look at them and read the packet and blah, blah, blah. You know, read it through the package and everything, but then put it back. Don't open that Ziploc until you're ready to plant it. Because as soon as you open that Ziploc, moisture can go in. And then if you refreeze it with that moisture, that can damage the seed. And then a seed that was supposed to survive for like five, six years, frozen, doesn't survive and it's no longer really viable. So it's all okay. I'm not going to go crazy down that road, but 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 if we talk about dialing in, seeds can be expensive. Seed libraries where you can get them for free allow you to experiment with seeds. And, and yeah, so okay, so we're going to talk about you know they need to spread, but we we did kind of talk. There's going to be some sort of moisture trigger, so it's like watering them or putting them against the damp um the damp soil. But then there's going to be a temperature trigger, so like spinach. Spinach is one of those where if it's too warm, spinach won't germinate. So if you try to plant spinach in June, soil is literally too warm that it won't trigger the seed to germinate. It'll just stay dormant. Sorry. It'll stay dormant as a little seed sitting in the soil until September, October comes around and the soil finally cools off. Enough. And it's like, hey, yeah, I can sprout. And sometimes we do plant seeds in the fall, like spinach, like lettuce, so that they would sprout in those colder conditions and then grow. So the point is, is that with like spinach, if you put them on a heat map, which we'll, we'll talk about the stuff that's here, but if you put them on a heat map or if you have them in a warm part of your house that's 60 degrees, won't sprout at all because it's a cold loving plant. And so, so this is what I meant by like become an expert in the things that you want to write. Spinach is one of those that's just best planted right outdoors. I'm, I'm talking about some extremes. Not everybody wants to grow spinach. But by mentioning it, you may find that there's other plants that are cool, loving plants that are like that, that are part of those families. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what do you need for the first leaf? Okay, so we'll end up talking about controlling water and temperature and air. The airflow goes along with the water and the temperature in, in that adding air circulating into the whole system of growing seedlings inside can toughen those seedlings up, move them around, get some more, um, you know, get some more airflow and then can pull water, excess water out of there, but also might make it so they can have the water. There's all of these balances. So I'm going to end up showing you a few things. Oh, yeah. Here, let's look at this. Little trip. So if we're at least here, if we're at least well. March is blown by. March usually drags. For me, it feels like it's just like flying up. We're now closer to April first than March first. A table like this can help to show you just so it's just something that I put together. The pink. If you had somebody like I used to be, somebody who was like, "All right, it's January, it's February. I'm gonna start some seedlings in the house." I'm going to get some herbs going. If you put them on your windowsill, it's not enough light to get them growing because we're at 10 hours or less of daylight per day. That's why we feel the winter blues. But it's literally not enough solar gain for your little seedling to actually pack on the pounds and make light. And actually, so, so however, if you add a plant that you started in the fall, Brought it inside like you had herbs. We're talking about growing herbs. If you had started some herbs in the fall and then brought them inside and kept them protected, that amount of sunlight is enough to just keep them at their normal, like not wither and everything. It's enough for like homeostasis and just kind of like survive. And then you come along and snip it. You eat your herbs on the windowsill. 
Okay. But now we're getting towards the point. Once we get to men, that's that's the time of year where you're, you can have a plant on the windowsill. And it will finally get enough light on the windowsill where it doesn't reach for the plant. So, so an illustration like this is, is to point out anybody who's starting seedlings on a windowsill may not be getting enough light until we really hit men. And because light is food. We're a part of a cult. I would have you all chant light is food. It's a joke that I made, but like I'm not gonna So okay. You need to say some Thursdays in my face. Okay. So, so, um, so one one quick demonstration. Um, now I'm not going to give up on the camera thing. Okay, fine. We do it with my hands. All right. Normally I would have somebody come up and be my sunshine. Well, somebody wants to be my sunshine. I think that means he has to come up. Come on, sunshine. <laughs> What make you want? You want? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, you don't have to be on the other side. But just, okay, you're just the sun. And then, and I'm just going to get this here on you. Right. So, so, the sun's distance in the earth doesn't change. So, if you put the little plant in the windowsill, and it's dictated by that. It, does that come right? You kind of it's dictated by that how much sunlight you But now, and then you're like, you're my shop, you're a grow up. And if I'm like right here, the amount of food that I get in light from my light source can change depending on how high or low we raise those lights. If I back up, if I double this distance, this is now, I get half as much food. If I, if I back up again, double the distance again, like so, so then I get half of a half, I get fourth as much. Let's go the other way, we're going to get uncomfortably close, okay? The sun track, that's our average. So let's say we got the, we got the lights, and they're eight inches away. Eight, eight inches isn't that far, right? You got your plant, you got eight inches. If we go to four inches, that's twice as much food, sunlight, that we're able to get because it's by the square. So, let's see, no, yeah, twice, no, two, no, that's four times as much. This is by the square. Two times two is four, right, folks? Yeah, that's now. Okay. If we go again, it then like doubles again. And then, okay, fine, but we're not that far enough. Okay. But, but if we get to like, okay, so we went from eight to four to like two inches, the amount of food here, right? <laughs> Thank you. But the amount of closer that you get it, there's a significant difference as you back away. That's the way I want you to think, actually. I tend to have my lights about an inch away from the plants. So if you have your lights too far away, your, your plants are going to grow spindly, trying to reach for the light to get the food. They will grow tall instead of average. So, okay, so, so all of this is to make comparisons. Okay, so your own home plants that you have, it used to be my plants in an apartment a long time ago. Okay, the amount of sun that they got from the light, or from the window, was just enough to keep them at homeostasis most of the time. Every now and then they, in the summer, they get a little more light, they grow a little bit. For the most part, they just stay in the same. Life like this, they're not gonna do it for growing things indoors, unless you get those lights really close to the plants. And then, Something like this. This is getting there, but we have to be able to drop that light really close. And that that light, when I looked at it, it's only like a one bulb thing. So it's only the width of it is not as wide as like a whole tray. So it's still not good. Stuff like this can be spending. That that is that can be around it. You know, these are like LEDs and everything. Is anybody messing around with those? Some people get in the, you know, once you make the investment, people kind of love that. All right, you know, the whole thing of the pink wavelengths, but yeah, why are plants green? It's because they don't use the green wavelengths. It's useless to them. They reflect it away. That's why we see the green. So what colors do, so go back to like, you know, go back to whatever the colors are within the spectrum of light, all well, of your blues and your reds are what the plant absorbs. That's why you get that pinky purple light. Because it's the wavelengths. Do you have to care about that? No, because you can just 
white light has those wavelengths in it. White light is like a complete diet. It just has an extra green in it that you don't need. So you can just use regular light shop lights. You can start going the fluorescent type, you know, and that's 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 what I use at my house. I've got the shop lights that are four foot long with the two tubes in each. So that's what I'm gonna show you is my setup. And so this is the part where we talk about creating a little station. This is this station was enough to fit, let's see, on this bottom row, four of those trays here in four. Four times four, that's 16 trays. This was enough to run my mini farm. Do you mean this much? No. I mean, that must be good. I mean, if you want to grow like, if you want to grow mescaline, like little baby black screens all year long, set up like this. To have you just like fresh, like not going to the grocery store, but always like, you're going to be paying an electric bill. But like, you're going to have the, the, the joy of growing them, cutting them whenever you need it. Having like little salad greens or herbs. So, and you could just do like one little bang of lights. So what you'll see here, it's it's like a Yankee special, right? It's it's a little remnant. But that's because it's in my basement, because when you're dealing with plants, kind of water and make a little mess, grow on that on my hardwood floor, you know, you know, and so this becomes a little environment. It could be a garage or a basement, or even a closet that, that you have where you can kind of create a micro environment. So that's what I'm gonna talk about. And you just, you know, not, not crazy. I want you to notice how all the electrical stuff is up high. That's for safety. to keep it so that if water, or to, you know, electricity and water, I want it up high than up in water. And and so just decoding this, oh my God, it's wires everywhere, but it's not rocket science. So I have I have heat mats and I have lights that need electricity. And so the you know, so I plug this into and then I take a timer. Do I need to have a timer for the lights? No. They could stay on all these. I don't want to pay for them all the time. I like to show them up for like while I sleep, the hours of night. So I set that timer. This then gets plugged, you know, and then have that where the lights plug in. Ready? Yeah. Okay. And then off of this, I could like turn off a set of lights, switch on a set of lights, all that jazz. That's the rules. And then the other direct one, not in the timer, is 24, 24 hours a day. It is a, a little thermostat. So I know that this might seem like a lot, but if you're here and you're part of the cult of growing things, you, you might be in, this might be a required investment. So this little thermostat, just it's just a little thermometer goes in the tray in the center. And I don't need expert to try it, but in the center where the moisture will always keep a good contact and always get a good reading. And what you can do is then you plug your heat mat to that. And sure that the heat mat turns off. This gets above a certain setting. So if you're growing, let's go back to eggplant. Eggplant wants germination temperature of about 85 degrees. Nobody wants to keep their house at 85 degrees. Oh, well, no, okay, some people might. <laughs> but maybe not everybody wants to pay for that, for this, for this seedlings and everything. The thermostat will begin an heat map. So a little heat map like this, you know, 20 bucks or so, um, is enough for one tray, one tray. And you create a little micro environment for those tomatoes, those peppers, those whatever you want that, that, that like that tropical environment to germinate on this tray with the thermostat. Thermostat makes it sure that this shuts off should it get too hot. That way you don't end up like cooking your plants. Same thing with, with a lot of other plants, kind of like it to be around 70 degrees. And this will kind of Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, little stuff like this, just if we're talking about germination, um, I do tend to keep like a little dome over whatever I'm growing. And once the seedlings are, you see a little bit of green, and then it takes off. This helps to preserve the moisture in this like little microclimate and the heat. But once they pop up, you become, if you keep them under the dome, you become at risk. And you'd be too moist on the leaves and the stems of those baby plants. 
and molds and stuff growing on them, fungi growing on them, attacking them. You take this off, and then that gives the plants that are popping up out of the soil, those little baby germinated plants, the airflow that they need to keep their leaves dry. Well, is there a question back there? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we'll get the gold frames. So yeah, absolutely. So 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 this, you're right. Seed starting at this, this class is for the geeks. And okay, so we start at like, those who want to stuff that comes right away, like um, you can grow other things that are now legal to grow in Connecticut. In this system, you can get it to a certain amount where it's an abating effect under five plants. Is that what it is? I don't know. Like a red elk or something. And then you can bring them out to your garden. Okay. <laughs> okay, that you can turn on, you can shut off. Right now, my whole system is shut down. I actually don't even bother to start seedlings until my April vacation. I'm a school teacher. That's when I got a big chunk of my time. Boom. That's how I'm going to do a lot of my seedlings. I'm not, I don't worry about, you know, the perfect time to go. Oh, uh, the what? The top? Once I see little green things popping out of the soil, that's when I remove them. It's too missing in Germany. Yeah, yeah. So, so for some things, like, uh, where the, did the seeds make it around? Do you see how some of the seeds are like dust? Okay, those are little seedlings. Remember, they have a little back. And, it, and they have a little tiny, you know, bit of life inside of them, that little baby plant that's inside them. If you plant that under a quarter inch of soil, or half inch of soil, there's no way that the back of the food gives it enough energy to push that seedling out of the soil. So what I'm trying to do by showing you all those different sizes of seeds is to actually, I want you to think about, does this seedling have enough energy to pop through an inch of soil? Well, like there, there was the squash seed. Did you guys see that? The squash seed, big seed. Can that pop through an inch of soil? Absolutely. The little, the little ones? Well, what do you do with them? And even, you don't even cover them with soil. You take those and sprinkle them on and just press them against the moist soil. That's all. Because that's what they've evolved to do. They've evolved to travel in the wind, land on the soil surface when it's like, you know, moist springtime. Get that moisture temperature trigger in the spring. Germany, drop the taproot, grow a seedling. And, you know, that's what those itty bitty ones have done. So, like, like something like parsley, little tiny seeds, and I don't even put them under the soil, just press them on the soil. And it's those seeds, I'm like watching them, watching them under the dome, under the dome. And sometimes it can take like two and a half weeks for those little parsley seeds to finally turn green once they see that they've opened up. That's when I take the dome off. So some plants, it might be a week or five days. In other plants, it might be three weeks or so before you see them actually germinate. And this is where you become an expert on your thing. You know, like I was growing, um, I was, lettuce tends to pop up pretty quickly, like within that week's time span. And if it hadn't popped up after two weeks, that means something went wrong. You know, you know, and that means maybe the moisture was too much. So, so but yeah, 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 and then we'll finish this. Game. Yeah, the dust. Yeah, yeah. So, so with little tiny plants like that, that's an herb where we don't need that herb to grow up to become a giant plant. We can harvest that herb as little baby seedlings. You know, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or we can, as they, as that little clump of seeds matures, we can break it apart, plant to plant. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of player like. Now, if those were carrot seeds, and you were to dump a bunch of carrot seeds all in one spot, those carrots are not going to turn into carrots because they're too close to each other. So you learn about pressure, and some plants can't take the pressure of their neighbor, their siblings next to them. You have to give them the space and thin them out. So like carrots would be one where you have to thin them. I know from experience, a right is one, I get thin them out. It'll naturally like do its own thing. Um, okay, so other things I want you to see. So like this idea of like using using either metal, something sturdy, some kind of like um shelving system that's sturdy. I use these metal, 
you know, factory shelving units that I basically got for free from the mill that was like closing, you know. Um, I can hang those. So the lights, the shop lights, are hanging with these like little ratchet straps. Um, again, this stuff's like linked in. I used to do chains. I used to raise and lower the chains. That's a pain in the butt. Two sets of lights five times all of those to raise them when I need the water and everything. This is one of those where it's like I need to raise it and I need to, there's a little release. There's one room. And then I can like lower, lower the lights. Lower it on one end and lower it on the other. So in the little one clip goes to the top, one goes to the light. So simple little things like like these make a system um, monitor where you can adjust it to the heights of the plants and you can adjust it for the needs. So you'll also notice that I have plastic on top of my heat mat and that's just so the whole thing is like I can take that plastic out and I can like clean the whole surface like all the dirt and everything's on that plastic layer and if I over water it kind of collects on the plastic instead of going all over the place. So, um, so this is what it looks like with, with one bay of them on and then I like I personally, in my, my basement in that area, it tends to be cold. So I do use this like reflective, you don't have to. This is like, you know, you know something like this reflects light back into the system because light is food, but it also insulates. This is like a thing, comes in these rolls that are like two feet wide. It's, a, it's an insulation. And then you also see that little pump sprayer that's there. That's what I use to water the trees when they're inside. Because it, it's just a, a little misting is all you really need. So, and then we'll stop growing. So I'll pull the lights up so I can take a picture of them, and then the lights go back out when I'm not. And so I, you'll notice that on my plastic trays, there's no like, there's no like little six packs or anything. So I'm going to teach you about soil blocks in a, in a bit. Um, so yeah, yeah, we'll see them popping up, popping up, popping up. Um, okay. So these pictures are in here. These are like the key components for like an indoor growing system. Something to hold the, the what you're growing. I like those because they have air circulation all around. I do bring this this one to the classes. Um, then it, so when you look at these 10, 20 trays. So again, why do I push for these? Is because they're inexpensive. They're everywhere. All the garden centers use these, so they have them inexpensively. They also make solid ones like this that they cost a lot, but you can, if you have that dining room table that you really want to buy stuff on, you can create a little contained system where the water from this gets collected. That's why I bring it for, for people to see. Um, typically, in that whole system, though, will matter. I might start start seedlings in like on one like little heat mat. But once they pop up, they don't need the heat anymore. Move them down, start an intro. Once those pop up, move them over. Imagine all winter long I'm doing this, and then sometimes I'm bringing plants out to the garden. It's constantly like cycling, exciting things in. <laughs> okay. A fan of some sort, not blowing direct to the whole system, but just blowing in the room. Box fan, I like to just have on low, but it could also just be an oscillating. Something like that, just on the low, just enough to give some some circulation. Um, so I like water with. I don't like water with this stuff because it's the jack of all trades, master of none. Um, it does a horrible job of watering things. I will say, so like my favorite water is like this. So when I was a teenager, at Hart's greenhouse in Florist in Canterbury, Connecticut, this was my summer job. It's just to water things, just to water. Is that my no hearts? I don't know. It's the other side of the state. Then you Route 14. Route 14, Westminster Road. There you go. Oh, yeah. Down back by right side. Don't worry. Okay. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. So small parts right now. And um, the thing is, is that like a tool like this is made for water. So when you get your seedlings outside, this provides a general range. When you're in your garden or You've got like hanging baskets. You've got your raised beds. I like to put a shut off right here so that when you're done watering, you just shut it off. That's so you can water. 
Cut it off, let it soak in. And some of the bird and then we don't want to keep it. Let it soak in. So we'll show off at the end and click the next. Use it like this changes your life. Switch to quick next that like on the hose and the faucet, everything. You can assemble and disassemble things. When you have little itty bitty plants and you hit them with like this weird thing, it can like flood everything out. It once had a student water the seedlings that we just seeded in the tray. And I did give him this. And of course, he's like a middle schooler. You just I didn't tell him what to do. He just did this. He just flooded all the seeds out. Just kept watering. Just kept watering. And this is the, the, the soil's flowing out. And you are smarter than that. That was worth the story. Go ahead and have your kids and grandkids do that. And just yeah and then then you teach them. The biggest bang for your buck for heat maps are these um like yeast types, which which you don't see me have in person. It's linked in the resources. It's like it's a uh, all right, step timers. Timers on your phone for watering. So, so what what you should do is set a morning timer and an afternoon timer. If you if you have seedlings at home, as soon as you wake up, you should check on those seedlings to see if while they were on the heat map, the soil starts to dry. Out. The soil starts to dry. By the time you come home from work or your day's adventures, they will all be dead because they'll all be dried out. So use that like a little mister and everything. Same thing in the evening. If you go to bed, if you didn't check on them, but they were dry, you know, starting to dry before you went to bed while they're on heat mats and fans ball and everything. By the time you wake up in the morning, they'll all be dead. So, um, okay. Planting depth. So we kind of talked about that. Um, the smaller the seed, the closer to the surface it needs to be. There's a general rule of like 10 times the diameter of the seed. It's like, who's going to do that? Big seed can go pretty deep. Little tiny seed towards the soil surface. And then sometimes I'm planting seeds, and I'm just taking a little bit of soil and just dusting it over and then patting. Sometimes I'm planting seeds just by sprinkling them on the ground. Okay. There, again, this is the seed starting success point. Some of you who like to grow flowers, there's some flowers that like darkness. Being the seedlings will not sprout unless they're in complete darkness. They'd evolve to be under the cover of like leaves, to germinate under the cover of leaves. So you would need something like black plastic. I think like Dianthus is one of them. Mm -hmm. So if you are like becoming an expert in one of the things, you read the seed packet that says needs darkness to germinate. You go through all the same things of like setting up the heat packs and all that jazz, but then just lay something black. Maybe like a tea towel over the top would be fine enough. Maybe check on it. See if they're popping up. Once they're popping up, take the top. Um, you may hear of words like stratification and scarification. These are with creating things. So once I only had to deal with stratification once, which is with that freeze thaw cycle when I wanted to grow elderberries from a seed. I don't know why, but I bought these seeds, they were cheap, and I was like, I'm gonna grow elderberries from seeds. And we, the thing is that they need their prey. So they need to be tricked into thinking that they were in the ground and frozen and survived the winter and then spring had come. So if I'm going to put them on the heat map and everything, I had to go through this cycle. Point is, is that these are advanced techniques, but at least you like hear the words. And if you're if you're growing something that says a need, so okay. In order to grow their first leaves, so the food that they have in their back is enough to get them. Their first little baby leaves, but the first true leaves that actually look like the leaves of the plant, that comes from the photosynthesis. That comes from pulling some micronutrients from the soil. Potting soil is, is inert. It tends to be dead seed starting soil specifically. It's a good thing because seed starting soils that if you were to reuse the soil year after year or something like that. You could be hard, like bring in fungi and disease that could kill your seedlings right from the get. So always the best practice to start with like fresh potting, you know, seed starting mix for your seedlings. Once they the seedlings have started, they started to grow, you could then pop them up into other containers that that could be things that 
and you have your own compost in them and everything. So um, I'm going to talk about the seed starting mix that I've made. So regular seed starting mix that you buy. It's good because you have an idea that it releases the water. So you typically come starting a tray of whatever. Before I put seeds in it, I water the tray with my watering wand. Once I know it's watered through and through, the water that's in that is typically enough to get them to sprout. You know what I mean? Like the watering, that initial watering, I tend to not have to water them at all until they've germinated. And then I take the dome off. Once you take the dome off, that's where you're adding more air circulation. And then you need to keep an eye on water. Um, so that seed starter mix allows it to release excess water. So I tend to water all my trays outside, bring them inside, seed them, put them under the grow beds. Um, or when you're talking about a cold tray, so I might water, you know, get the seed trays ready, seed them at, the, at my picnic table to get it, and then bring them to the cold frame, you know, and so that would be for cold loving plants, like my peas, like my lettuces, but not my tomatoes, not my peppers. Those have to be started in, indoors if we want to grow that. Um, so as plants grow, that idea of the right size of the pan, if you start off your, your seedlings close to each other, it's very efficient for getting them to germinate because you have that small microplant. But as they grow out, if they start the leaves of one plant start to touch another, that's a, they feel each other and they will grow taller to create a canopy above their neighbors. So if the leaves are starting to touch one another and you don't want them to grow taller and you want them to grow wider, you actually have to start to give them more room. And that's that's where potting them up could come in. Okay. So those are cow pods made out of like compressed what is it? Cow manure, composted cow manure. It's like kinetic pods. Those are good. The roots grow right through those. They decompose in the ground. The, the local product. Peat pods. Well, that's fine. Peat pods are just peat moss, though. They're inert. They don't have any like nutrition, nutrients in them. This is just like neutralized heat. But that can be a good way to start. But then they're going to need some sort of fertility after. These trays can be filled with little soil blocks. So this is where, has anybody done soil blocks before? Ooh. Okay. With a little press? Like, sweet. <laughs> um, it's, so going and teaching this class, Used to be like never. At least there's like every now and then there's somebody I did pay you with it. So okay, these are the mid, little mini soil blocks. So you basically make your potting mix, mix it up. You even add some compost to it. That compost makes it like a little sticky, but it has nutrition to it to kind of keep the plants growing. And then you make it like an oatmeal texture, like you know what I mean. You fill up with enough water where it's like whoosh. And then you press this into a pan and you bring this to your tray and squeeze out little blocks of soil. In those little blocks of soil, you can plant, like this is this is four by five. This is 20 little things. I could plant 20 raw tomatoes, 20 beef steak tomatoes, 20 jalapeno peppers, all you know, you know what I mean? All in one like little tray, and then put them in that like little environment to sprout. And then when they all popped up, the ones that popped up, the ones that didn't pop up, well. Look, I only wasted a little bit of rock soil. Whatever. The ones that did pop up, I take them and I pop them into a larger block. And do you see like that idea of like potting up gives them the, the canopy room to develop and grow? And so so I'm a big believer in soil blocks because it also helps us move away from the plastic cell and like, just grow away from it. Um and like some people will try to like reuse the plastic cells here for your that to be reintroducing like soil borne diseases to your growing system. I mean, unless you bleach them, you know, you know what I mean? You wash them with soap and water. This $30 tool, $20, $30 tool. And now, man, this is like on 10 million stuff now. Um, so, like, these are actually like on Amazon that they used to not. Um, I used to go to a, like a farm store online and like buy these from a farm supply store. But yeah, this squeezes out little blocks that have a hole in them where I could put the other little blocks. Or I could not do the mini blocks, and I could just make a whole tree of these blocks. 
that are, that are like, you know, they're like an inch and a half by an inch and a half. And just put the seeds directly into that. And that's what I normally do. I normally don't do the mini blocks. I do the mini blocks only for like, you know, you know the seed, like the tomato seed, where I only get like 10 seeds of a seed now. I want every single one of those to germinate. So I will like use my old tray system to like get every single one to germinate. Okay. Anyway, yeah, square boxes that look like when they pop out. Now, if you want to spend a lot of money, those are the $200 stand up soil blockers, which save your back, but that's like for the farm scale. I had three of them because I had a problem. Um, so they make all sorts of different sizes and it's like, well, it's already a was a rhino. Okay, so, um, all so, right, soil blocker, soil blocker, maybe. And then the little block just dip, to pop it in the soil. So that looks like, see, is that cilantro? It looks like to me. Just planting that in the soil versus, you know, that, you can plant those in your garden. That's fine. But like soil blockers, the roots, there's a little air gap between each block. So, you know, when you have a potted plant, and it runs out of the room for the roots and it starts to go around and it starts to, right? What soil block, what the growth pattern of the soil block tends to do is that little seedling, when it gets to the edge where there's a little air gap, is that it's called air growing. It senses that there's air at that gap. It doesn't grow out anymore. Instead, it grows out sideways through the root and it creates a densely packed, not a root mold, but a densely packed set of roots that when you put them in the ground, those roots are all ready to go touch the soil and just keep going. And so also with peat pots, you, you know with peat pots, that pot kind of has to break down a bit when you plant it in the soil. This, there's like no wait period. You put it in the soil, it's ready to go. I love soil blocks. Sure. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so just going to pop them out in trays like this. You see that? And, and you'd think, you'd think when you go to water them, that it would all fall off. But here's the thing, remember that we got them like moist, like uh, oatmeal, and then we squeezed them out and some excess water gets pushed out. The, I see directly into those, see directly into those, the seeds have enough water in the soil, and then I tend to not have to water them for, for days. What it does is it kind of solidifies each block as they dry out a little bit, and then they're good. I don't let them dry them all the way, and then I kind of fully water them, and they hold their shape. Um, so, okay. Um, so, when I ran the farm, the rain is like an organic certified. It's like, it's a lot. It's a lot to do that to not buy like petrochemical fertilizers and to not use like pesticides and herbicides that are not biologically derived. It's a lot. Right off the shelf, though, this, like, this is a product that is complete fertility, like nutrition, nutrition wise for your NPK, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Yeah, I did it. Okay. So, so what, what makes it organic? Well, it's made from living stuff. When you look at the ingredients, it's going to say bone meal, feather meal, blood meal, so like alfalfa meal. What does that mean? It means that it's ground up bits of things that once were living. So yes, the byproduct of like the animal harvesting industry, but it's organic. It is made from that and not like petrochemical fertilizers. Anyway, so why do I bring this up? Remember that I make my own potty mix? The potty mix that I'm going to describe to you right now is the same mix that I use for soil blocks, for seed starting, and for container gardening. Everybody who like has like a little patio area, garden area, you want to grow stuff, but you don't want to use the bags stuff you want this is this is so i i will use one cup of that in a whole wheelbarrow of of mix or sometimes i because i brought a bigger scale i will mix green fan rock phosphate and blood meal i'll make my own mix do you have to make your own mix no you could just use what is it that one you could just use that one. but i do you know bigger bag for my buck i also add a bag of compost to the mix and I tend to be not using straight paint moss. <laughs> I tend to be using a mix like this one, the all-purpose growing mix, or the pro mix, or the, these mixes that they have perlite or mitulite mixed into them that has aeration and, and adds a little bit of you know, water retention, air, air, air. You can look at this later. 
but that's my general thing. Here it is in pictures. So either in a pan or in a wheelbarrow, I mix it up and I use the garden hoe to mix it up. Not four bags, four parts. You know what I mean? I, I take a five gallon bucket. Yeah, you know, I take a bucket, I fill four of those with the mix, and then I fill a bucket with a compost, you know, one bag of compost, but then I fill a bucket. You get the four parts? Like, and then and then my like fertilizer mix with that four parts. If I'm doing buckets like that, that's a real though. Remember, it's like about a cup of fertilizer. So you get you get the diverse fertility of the yeah. compost in the mix. That adds fungi and beneficial fungi, beneficial bacteria to the whole mix. It adds life to the mix into the potting soil. The other stuff, add the volume so that you're not like just growing in compost. You know, because that can get expensive. You're talking about like filling up a raised head. That can, although you've got, you've got tops, you know, and stuff like that. But like that can get spendy too. So, okay, so that's, again, that's like my general mix for the soil box, my general mix for container gardens. Because of the compost, because of the other, the scoop of, of, of fertilizer, that tends to keep it going for most of the season. Um, I hope we have time to talk about all your spreads with compost. Okay, so you started your little seedlings. Um, you got to get them ready for, for going in the garden. Okay, so 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 they've been in your house, they've been on your window sill, they've been on their walls. Um, they need that idea of monitoring the root growth. That might mean that you pull one up and you're like, you see if they're if it like is running out of room for its roots, and you look at the canopy and see if it might need to be potted up. So sometimes we make these choices to grow tomatoes in February, and it turns out to be a bad choice. Because of those tomatoes are growing for way too long indoors, and we don't have the room to give them the room that they want. That's why I start my tomatoes in April or May, because they tend to be fast growing. By the time they get to a size that's ready to plant out, it's Memorial Day. It's finally warm enough consistently. Soil temperatures are warm enough where they're going to thrive. I don't know if you know tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, like that whole family of things, and potatoes. They're all a family of nightshades. I want you to learn about different families of vegetables. They have similar needs to each other, and they all tend to like to grow in warm environments. That means that when you put them outside and you protect them, you're like a crochet and stuff like that, it's not the ideal growing condition. Studies have shown that with tomato plants, if you start them early, protect it, versus just waiting and putting them outside once the soil temperatures are 50, 60 degrees, consistent temperatures, warm temperatures, like Memorial Day run. The ones at Memorial Day will get to maturity faster than the ones that had been stunted. Now, our market gardeners, when you go to the farmer's market and you're like, you got tomatoes yet, you got tomatoes yet, you got tomatoes yet, you got tomatoes yet. You're just wait a week. Now they do have varieties, they have way, they may have like high fruits and stuff like that that do accelerate the season, do heat up their soils, but the backyard gardener may not be doing that. Uh, you can definitely look at soil, so uh, what is it? Um, season extension. All right, so hardening off. That, that's worth talking about. It's, yeah, you want to harden off the plants through exposure to wind and temperature fluctuations. So that little baby plant that's been growing inside. You want to get them used to being outside. These things are garbage. It's okay if you bought them from Ocean State Java. I know. It's okay. I bought one too. But if you're like me, you bought it, but then it like fell apart. Did your like little plastic pieces at the end where all the pipes connected and just broke and then you're like swearing and you're like, ah, and you get glue and duct tape and it's a mess. And then like the plastic, okay, all right. So it's not meant to really hold any weight. It looks like a greenhouse, but it's not a greenhouse. These, they look great. By the way, you want to grow mushrooms in your you can do, but this is a great thing to grow mushrooms in your So that can be, but again, it can't really hold the weight. You want to create your own microclimate from growing things inside. That can be used, but you bring that outside where in Connecticut we get the installs, that's going to end up in your neighbor's yard. Oh. So, so stuff like that are gimmicky. They're not really made for like gardeners. Like this. 
There's your cold break. You know, stuff like this, that's where your season protection is. And so it doesn't have to be anything like rocket science. One thing I would want to be careful about is those windows. We want to make sure that they're tucked in an area where wind won't flow those windows away. You know, the wind can't get underneath them because then you got broken glass everywhere. And so I, I tend to like the plastic panels that you can find at Home Depot and Lowe's. You know, they're two feet by four foot by eight foot, the kind that you might I mean, start looking for plastic panels to find them. They don't look like that the corrugated stuff. Sort of, again, like horrible use for it. Those plants don't need to be in a cold frame because those are cold loving channels. Anyway, <laughs> those are ornaments. Something crazy. But a little box like that, a little box like this, does it need to be angled? No, it doesn't need to be angled. One thing I'd be worried about with this though, that is a good use of like an old door, old window. I've built these before, and lead paint is one thing to be careful of. You don't want that near stuff where you're growing food. Let's say it doesn't have lead paint and everything. Those tend to be, those glass doors, windows tend to be very heavy. And if you get one good wind, it picks it up. That little lever falls, and then it slams, and glass goes everywhere. Like I've moved away. Do you guys hear what I mean? I do like the idea of reusing stuff, but with something like this, I'd probably put a strap in. With something like this, I probably wouldn't have it be a post. I would have it be something that locks at the top and locks at the bottom and nothing can move. And so when is it when is it open? If you're taking your seedlings from the basement and bringing them outside, you could do the daily shuffle where <laughs> I've done this. Where, okay, you wake up in the morning, you're like, okay, that tray needs to go outside and bring it outside and put it near the house where it's protected by the wind. It still gets like some afternoon or morning sun, but not full sun the whole time. Because did you know that like little baby plants can get sunburned? Because they're not used to direct sun. They've been underneath your heat lamp. You might hold sun thing and everything. The sun is really powerful if you're really coming. Okay. And heat and like grow lights are not as powerful as direct sunlight today. Has anybody like gotten like a, a March or February sunburn before? Good. I feel like my cheeks are rosy just from this weekend. Same thing happens with your plants. Hardening them off and getting them used to the intense sunlight and the intense winds, those winds can snap the stems of your baby plants. And this is where like our secret weapon comes in. If you put the pros use, the pros use row covers. So is that we use these before? Like so this stuff you so it's not a frost blanket. If you if you look up frost blankets, they're thicker. They're thicker. And frost blankets are what the um is what the nurseries use in the extremes of the season to put over their plants and remove every day. At night they put them on and the, and the, in the morning, they take them off. This is a road cover. It lets in, a, it's thin and lets in about 85% of the sunlight. The sun is food. That means that your little baby plants, you take the tray, you put them outside, you put the road cover on, and you anchor it. You find a way of holding this down. It breaks like rocks or sticks and stuff like that, little stakes. Your plants can grow underneath this. Water goes through it, sunlight goes through it. And you can leave them out all day long and it protects them from frost, it protects them from, from the wind, it protects them from the direct sunlight. There's that like little bit of filtration. This is what your market growers are using. The people at your farmers markets, they're using this by the acre. If you go by, like, man, you some of the names of the farms out there. If you go by some of the farm fields out there and you see the white stuff on the field, you'll notice it. They're trying to grow early crops underneath this. Um, by the way, your brassicas family, your broccoli, your cabbages, um, all of those get like the cabbage worms, your kales and all that. You know, the little white moths that fly around and you're like, oh, it's a corner. No, it's like, it's a cabbage moth. It's going to lay eggs and it's going to be little green worms. If you have this on your seedlings from when you plant them, you put this on top, this row cover on top, those little moths. Land on the fabric, they can't lay eggs. So they go for somewhere else and lay eggs. And you have, and this is also what organic gardeners use, so they don't have to spray pesticides and herbicides. 
keeps the bugs from laying the eggs. And so it does Okay, so row covers. Row covers used inside of a cold frame is like a whole other level of protection. And that's where, like, you get like the French market gardeners in, you know, in Europe who are growing veggies in like November, December, January and bringing those foods to market. And then we have like American farmers that are trying to do that. Look up Elliot Cole. That's a, that's, a, that's a name to look up. Okay. Cold frame. Oh my God. So that's in a high tone. That's in a high tone. But then you guys get it. That's what row covers look like when plants are growing underneath them. So, so remembering back to this particular garden of mine, growing underneath those row covers are lettuces, spinach, bok choy, top soy, your Asian greens, mustard greens, kale, kale greens are growing underneath that, beets, carrots. All of those cold loving plants thrive by being planted outside early and protected from the wind. The wind blows over the plants and pulls the moisture away from the plants. It stunts their growth. Don't realize how much it stunts their growth until you actually start using this. And it's it's amazing. Okay, so yeah, that's me and my daughter and the plants and seedlings in the soil box at the picnic table. And then getting them out to the greenhouse. And then, uh, so once you've got a greenhouse, you kind of don't even need this whole like indoor grow system thing. You just find the time of the year to grow things. Do you need a big greenhouse? No. You walk, if you were to build one, make one, you could make a small one out of those plastic panels. You don't need a big space, but it needs to have ventilation so the whole thing doesn't become an oven. And I like a floor that's not a dirt floor that I can like put put things on and the roots so like that plywood floor that's fine enough. Um, doesn't it just doesn't need to be very big? But you get like the solar gain. You get it's like a cold frame. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Green hand plow, right to the Green hand It's meant to be drawn towards you. You sharpen the edge like a blade. Slice it right through the plants. The easy digger. Right? This is for like, like this. So it's not like a garden trowel that you use like this. Ergonomically, it's one where you talk to you. Yeah, sure. You plant. Okay. By the way, in the wind. Six inches long, inch wide, regardless of not the four inch ones. It's, it's amazing the four inch garden staple just doesn't hold, but the six inch staple will. Yeah, so yeah, if we go back to the row cover, don't touch the table. <laughs> I'm sorry, I touched the table. Yeah, there are people who do that. So it's called a floating rope cover because it can be right in contact with the plant. There's no need to have it raised up in the box. Um, so if that rope cover is 60 inches in width, I'm actually only using it for about 40, 40 feet. So instead of, instead of five feet of width, I'm really only using it for about four feet of width, knowing that some of that is going to be height plants use underneath. Can I answer your question? Right? So the spacing and the how. Yeah. Yes. Bunch. So that, so that as the plants grow, there's like looseness to it. Yeah, no, 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 no. It doesn't. It, yeah, it doesn't. I, I have some pictures later on where like, just other ways of like growing. So that's all soil. Okay, we're, yeah, we're right towards the end. Row covers. Okay, so what is it? So bricks. 
something like that. Just, it's just to show the spacing. Spacing like that is enough to keep the weight down. Okay. Um, okay. Every now and then having a stick. I've done that. I have stakes. I just put the stakes out. One thing is that the rope ends up being caught on the, the splinters of the sticks. I do like to bundle my row covers up and use them year after year. After a couple of years, three years or so, they get too much sun exposure and they start to tear. Um, so, so you tend to cycle them out. Um, I will say that if you bundle them up, you should also invest in a tote box to put them in so that the mice don't have like this big bundling nest to be like, oh, thank you, thank you, home. And then they just tear the whole thing off and then it's like now you've got shredded garbage. That's a piece of rebar, a piece of rebar just laying across. That's nice and clean. And then stuff like this, whether it's PVC, this is, um, is it, is it, is that like, is that like a uh, concrete wire mesh that they use on their, that reinforcing? It's like rebar though. It's a different angle, right? Because it's, all right, anyway. Um, so stuff like that, stuff like that. Okay, my favorite tools. Write the bonus section. You got legacy, you can leave, but we're going to do this. The thing will be real, real, real. You don't know this. This is the best thing ever. You, you'll never tip this over. You'll load it up so heavy that you'll get yourself into trouble and you won't be able to move it, but it still won't fall over. Okay, but that's what I do all my mixing. Do all my mixing. Um, Timers, have you got sprinklers? Timers, oh, those quick connects, the shutoffs at the end of every hose, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The very big the rain thing, that thing's garbage. And then, okay, this is the last one. These are things that I put at the end if I don't have time to just get it. Seed starting success. We talked about like getting seeds going. The big things that you should hear is that you're controlling moisture, temperature, and light. Which the temperature light. Moisture and temperature are the primary needs that it needs to germinate. Once they germinate, they need, they don't need the temperature really anymore. They mostly need, you know, you know, consistent moisture, but not too much. And, and light, getting the lights low. Once your plants are hardened off, we didn't, we didn't finish hardening off. So the process of hardening is getting them exposed to outdoor temperatures. You can do that. I was talking about bringing them in and out. Of the house, you can like bring them out, bring them in, bring them out, bring them in, or you could just build a little cold frame. That's what the whole point of the cold frame is. You build a little cold frame and leave them out 24 7 protected. Add row covers to that, and you've got even more insurance that they won't hit those like low temperatures that really stress them. Once they've been outside for about a week or so, getting exposed to the wind, getting exposed to the sunlight, a week. To a week and a half, that starts to strengthen them to the point where they can handle being in, in the elements. So that's finishing the hardening up there. Foliar sprinkle. Okay, so you know you got your plants in your garden, and hopefully your soil's fertile and all that jazz. But sometimes you might be tempted to like put fertilizer on the soil. Where it's really more is is this. Foliar spray means spraying the fertilizer on the foliage. So I forget the numbers, but it's somewhere up at like 90%. Instead of like 20 to 30% of the fertilizer getting used that's in the soil and the rest getting taken away by the rains and the rivers and everything like that and creating algae blooms, you know, foliar sprays, you spray them on in the morning on the foliage with a little mist there. Or is it stuff like this? So it's in a handout, it's, it's, you know, it's so, so okay, that good stuff that can be put into a, so it's a seaweed and fish emulsion, and it's mild enough that it can be put in a spray bottle to loop it down, right? There's there's powders that are soluble, calcium, stuff like that. You put them in a spray bottle like this, pump it up, spray it on plants. You don't even need that much. Like a tablespoon and a gallon of water, which is what's a whole part. You're just misting it on the leaves. And this is the reason why in the morning, because as the plant photosynthesizes, you are putting the nutrients that it needs, not down in the roots where it has to be transported up to where the photosynthesis is happening. It's putting it where the photosynthesis is happening, right at the cell surface, pulls it in, 
uses it in the photosynthesis, you know, uses it in that whole process, and then banks those as like sugars within the plant. And again, it's like up in the 90% range that the, like, the nutrients are getting used. Plus, you're not putting it everywhere where it doesn't need to be used in the soil. So, 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 and if you want to take it a whole nother step further, so compost teas, compost teas, um, it's literally taking compost, putting it in water, and then putting a bubble in it. Okay, why a bubble? Like a fit, like a fish tank bubble? And letting it like do that for like a day. If you let it do that for like 24 hours, what happens is you are oxygenating the water. If you were to put the compost in the water as it is, the, the growth of beneficial bacteria and fungi and stuff like that would just it would turn aerobic and use all the oxygen and just start to die and create a festering little pile of stuff that smells like crap. And then, all right. But if you add air to it, you're aerating in the fungi and the bacteria, the beneficial fungi and bacteria that you want on your garden, they accelerate, they grow. And then you use that and you spray that on your plants, and you're also adding like a layer of like, what is it like? It's like a bio layer of protection. You know how we have like gut microbes? Plants have microbes on the outside of them that are also like taking up space and protecting the plant. And when like those systems get thrown off by excess rain, by excess whatever and drought and everything, those microbes die away and other infectious microbes can take over. This route is a whole other way of like adding fertility, but also the beneficial bacteria and yeasts and, and, and fungi to them. It's okay, that's enough. That's, that's, that's pretty cute. We did it. Thanks for sticking to the long list. These, I've read a ton of books, but for this class, these are the two that I think everybody should go up to. They take your learning of like everything you get on a whole other level. Feel free to come up and take pictures. Soil blockers, oh my gosh. Spend the 20, 30 hours, get a soil blocker. Your life will change.